with a single tire supplier. As the Formula One season opens, our experts, Bob Farsha and Steve Matchett, break down last night's Australian Grand Prix. Is MotoGP really coming to the Brickyard? Is ethanol as a race fuel really a big deal? And what about the split in open wheel racing? A week away from the IndyCar season opener, we talk to Tony George, head man at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. As the Audis roll on, Acura steps up to challenge Porsche in an American Racing Classic. And how about that GT2 finish after 12 hours of Sebring? The next Dell Cup stars attack NASCAR's fastest track, running their fastest laps at the very end. These two decide it between them. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by Alltel Wireless. Hi there, welcome. This is Wind Tunnel. We're gearing up tonight to talk about uh, NASCAR and Indy cars and sports cars and Formula One and anything else that's on your mind when you call us. 866-W-TUNNEL would be the phone number. 866-988-6635. To save as much time as possible for Bob Varsha, Steve Matchett, and Tony George, we're going to get things moving here. Varsha and Matchett will be here first. So if you want to talk Formula One, call now. If you want to talk to Tony George, hold off a couple segments. We'll give you the go code when it's time to call. And with that, let's move right on into tonight's hot topics. We have them in abundance. 16 to go in the Atlanta Nextel Cup race. And at least one of the leaders, that one, is short on fuel. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did anybody see that debris? Everybody stops to top off, sets up a dash to the finish, in which Jimmy Johnson drove past Smoke. Smoke was trying really hard. Drove her in the wall. Johnson wins for the second week in a row. Some folks smoke conspiracy. Formula One, season opened in Australia. Kimi Raikkonen in his first drive for Ferrari, walked it, winning with ease. Rookie Lewis Hamilton, third behind his teammate Fernando Alonso. More highlights, lots of analysis, and your calls just ahead. Supercross, number four, Ricky Carmichael leading the last race of his Supercross career. And then James Stewart passed him and screwed up the Hollywood ending. James continues to run away with the championship. RC will make his late model stock car debut next week, Lakeland, Florida. Finally, the diesel Audi scoring its ninth straight ALMS win in yesterday's 55th running of the 12 hours of Sebring. That was overshadowed by two other stories. Acura, series debut. Finishing first, second, and fourth in LMP2. Andretti Green Racing taking the top two spots, upstaging the problem-plagued Porsches. And then there was the GT2 finish. Jamie Mello in the red Ferrari versus Jörg Bergmeister in the Porsche. You're aboard the Porsche. Prompts an email. Dave, Mello must be practicing for NASCAR. Maybe he's lined up to partner Montoya at Ganassi next year. That was some dirty driving at the end. And the win should be handed over to the Flying Lizard team. I like sports car racing because of the general lack of dirty driving. That's from MC Red, Blood, uh, Red Bluff, California. So, did you folks see a difference between Melo last night right there and Montoya in Mexico last week? In any case, there was no penalty. Melo wins in the closest finish in Sebring history. And with that, let's find out what else has you folks fired up. Once again, Fox can't show the old jock debris caution because there was no debris on the track. And that was the caution just for people that were going to run out of fuel. NASCAR fixes the races. This is Larry from Illinois, and I've had it with these jock debris. I'm sick and tired of NASCAR giving Jimmy Johnson the race. They want to caution when they right after he heard that he was going to be low on fuel. Isn't that pretty uh, coincidental? A caution for debris, and television never shown the debris. Thank God NASCAR is watching out for Jimmy Johnson and his career. 
for the record, our definition of a phantom caution is one in which we do not see the debris on TV. In the flood of post-race emails about that last caution, a bunch of them complained that it was, in fact, intended to help Hendrick Motorsports. And a couple noted how convenient it was that the caution helped the Cobalt Tools car win the Cobalt Tools-sponsored race. Come on, folks. That'd be like conspiracy or something. Personally, I don't buy that. I think they threw the caution, hoping for another side-by-side -side Atlanta finish instead of a fuel mileage derby. I find it hard to believe they did it to make the race sponsor happy when the sponsor money goes to Bruton Smith instead of to Daytona, and especially when the guy most screwed by the caution was the driver of the car sponsored by the official home improvement thingy of NASCAR. But that's just my opinion. Hey, as long as we're stacking one feature on top of another, let's make this our Racer Magazine question of the week. What the hey? Two-part question. Was the last Atlanta caution real or phantom B? If it was phantom, why did NASCAR throw it? And, of course, whatever you think, you can still save money on your Racer Magazine subscription. Go to www.racer.com slash speed TV. Nothing conspiratorial about that. Let's go to the phones. James is on the line from Waco, Texas. James, what's up? Uh, Waco, Kentucky. I'm sorry. Anyhow, uh, Montoya, hello? Yes, we're here. Uh, Montoya uh, looked great this weekend. Uh, looks like he's going to be the upcoming superstar. And the other part is how come everybody in NASCAR hates Toyota but loves Montoya? They're both foreign. What's the difference? That's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. One's Japanese, one's Hispanic, or I don't know. Uh, Montoya, after the race, used a foul, used, used bad language. Did you hear that? No, I didn't hear that. Yeah, apparently he said he was peed off about uh, the way the car was behaving or something. So now two questions about that. Will he get hit with the same penalty that Junior did when he said the S-bomb at uh, Talladega a couple of years? And whatever happened to the seven-second delay? Wasn't there a seven-second delay? <laughs> I don't know. We move on to Matt in Albion, Michigan. Matt, what's up? Dave, I'm tired of NASCAR putting an end to the real racing and a beginning to this World Wrestling Federation manufactured, bunched up Sports Center highlight film garbage. Why don't they just put the cars on pit road for three hours on TV? We can all look at the sponsors for a while, have a 15 lap shootout instead. <laughs> and then, I, you know, I, I mean, there's, I finally get my hopes up for strategy and NASCAR coming together on the track, and it just doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, Formula One last night, we saw huge crashes. The cars were pulled off to the side, local yellows for a lap. I understand that can't happen on ovals, but the fans are catching on that these yellows are just ridiculous. So what uh, happens, gonna... Matt, let me stop you there. What happens when the fans catch on? Are, I mean, well, are people going to get fed up and stop watching? Does this contribute to the ratings drop? What I'm wondering what the impact is, because if there isn't absolutely. an impact, they're never going to stop doing it. Well, absolutely. I've, I've been a fan of NASCAR for the past few years. Um, I'm, I'm, I consider myself a young fan, and so I guess I'm kind of important to the sponsors and whatnot. Yep. Um, I've... I've I'm, I'm honest. I've been going to the Indy Racing League, uh, Formula One. I used to be nothing but NASCAR fan. Um, I've every time I see NASCAR doing this, I uh, move more and more to the fans of. Your interest. I become more of a fan of the ALMS, um, the IRL Champ Car, Formula One. Uh, gotcha. You know, it's just not racing anymore. You know, strategy. I mean, Montoya was looking good to win the race on fuel. It was going to be exciting, and uh, NASCAR just wants the Sports Center. Uh, footage, you know, they want the side-by-side, -side, they want the wrecks. It doesn't matter if Jimmy Johnson wins or not. They, you know, they called the caution when Johnson was in the lead at California. Yeah. It's not It's not specific to the driver. It's specific to the side-by-side -side sports center they want the uh, show. footage. All right. NASCAR, make note. Matt, young fan, the guy you're looking for, doesn't like Phantom Cautions. We move on. Still to come here on Wind Tunnel, presented by All Bell Wireless. Your IndyCar boss, Tony George, is going to be here telling us about the future of Formula One at Indy, the possibility that MotoGP, the motorcycles, will be coming to the historic brickyard, and yes, I bet we'll talk about that split. And speaking of Formula One, the new season is underway. Speed's experts Bob Barsha and Steve Matchett join us after the commercials. We're going to break down the race, talk about the big issues in the sport, 866-W-Tunnel. If you want to talk to them, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by Alltel Wireless. Get by Circle exclusively from Alltel. And brought in part by TGI Friday's Restaurant's new right portion, right price menu. Give me more Fridays.
Welcome back. My first two guests worked nights this week. Bob Barsha and Steve Matchett joining David Hobbs and Peter Windsor, bringing you Speed's coverage of the season opening Australian Grand Prix. They join us now to elaborate. Steve, you start because I'm under huge pressure to get an answer to this question, and if I wait, we'll run out of time and it won't happen. Why do you Brits insist on calling Formula One motors lumps? <laughs> well... It's an old motor racing term because it's just a big weight in the back of the car. What you want to do is reduce that weight down, the mass, as much as possible. So you always have the car constructors, the chassis guys versus the engine guys, and the chassis guys will always refer to it as a lump. But it's a lump all over the world. Does anybody call it that besides the Brits? Uh, I don't know. You'll have to ask someone that's not a Brit. We move on. All the lumps <laughs> fired in anger this weekend. They don't, the they don't call season. them that in NASCAR? <laughs> <laughs> the motors or <laughs> no way uh no, you, not the officials <laughs> you called the race we're gonna let you call the highlights tell us uh, the best of what we saw today all right it was a great show uh, i think you know kimi raikkonen surprised everybody that's him in the ferrari the right of the front row alonzo on the left but watch the white bmws nick heidfeld gets to alonzo robert kubica gets to lewis hamilton who very calmly goes all the way around him and his teammate alonzo to slot into third place watch this around inside the track to the outside mind you this guy is in a grand prix for the first time in his life heidfeld made a pit stop when he came back out he had given up a couple of positions to the two mclaren boys there is hamilton leading his teammate behind kimi raikkonen who's disappearing at the rate of about a second a lap scott speed problems apparent air leaks in both front wheels i don't know what's going on it's good or yet Toro Rosso, but they haven't had much testing time not a good day either for another rookie heike kovalainen of finland was off the track as much as he was on it this was hamilton's second pit stop while he was in there and we thought that he would actually come in after alonzo but alonzo stayed out longer when a couple of laps needed a shorter fill up came out well ahead of his teammate so we split uh, second and third alonzo back up into p2 this was Felipe Massa in the Ferrari. This guy won the last race last year, dominated the offseason, but in qualifying, the gearbox electronics let him down. They, they changed the engine, started dead last in the field, got held up where he would have finished higher than the sixth place he did behind Giancarlo Fisichella, who is now the team leader at Renault. There is your podium, one of the youngest, in fact, arguably the youngest of all time, depending on how you do the math. 25, 27, and 22, the ages of the podium sitters. The race outcome certainly supports the pre-race odds for the championship, which we're going to post now. And, uh, I wouldn't know anything have, about gambling. Well, I know that, but the odds makers are making, <laughs> or were making, pre-race. Raikkonen in a prohibitive favorite, better than even. Alonzo next, Massa third. We're one race in. Are you guys prepared to expound about how things will look at the end? <laughs> well, I think these, races these numbers now. tell us one thing, David. That's why the house usually wins when you gamble. <laughs> I mean, it was a uh, Ferrari looked invincible. They looked very strong. And, you know, going into this season, there was a lot of speculation, actually amongst the other teams as well, that they were hoping that, for, that Ferrari would start to melt down with the loss of Ross Braun, Nigel Stepney, very unhappy at Ferrari, the loss of Michael Schumacher, of course, as lead driver. There's a lot of speculation that those dark suits of the past years at Ferrari would start to drift out of the woodwork and take control. But you're right, they looked, to me, absolutely perfect. Well, in fact, the field was probably pretty lucky, in fact, that Massa had to start from the back, or it might have turned out worse than it did. We might have had two red cars up there on the podium. We have an email that gets to the uh, the issue of Lewis Hamilton's uh, performance today. I want to uh, get your reaction to this. It says to all TV journalists in North America, you already invented Danica mania in IRL. Do not start the Lewis Hamilton mania in F1. He's on one of the two best teams, so he will be in the top four the whole season. Nothing exceptional there. Don't be in ecstasy like last night every time he makes a start, a pit stop, or a pass. Johan O'Neill in Montreal, Canada. I think there's a bone to pick with well, you guys. Well, come on. Jeez. Uh, you know, in the last 36 years, a lot of guys have come and gone in Formula One. In that time, Hamilton is the second to finish on the podium in his debut. The other one happens to be, like Mr. O'Neill, a Canadian, a guy by the name of Jacques Villeneuve. Is he saying the 1997 world champion was somebody that you shouldn't have made a big deal about? He was in the best car on the grid, too. I mean, mm. I mean, what nonsense. I mean, next time you get an email read on the air, make better use of our time. Ooh. 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 Oh, let's try the phones. Maybe we'll have better luck there. This is Stanton in Richmond, Kentucky. Stanton, go ahead. You're on with the F1 guys. Yeah, the gearbox on the Ferrari, the new gearbox, it's real fragile. I think we've already seen that in qualifying. I was wanting to know, 
are they going to be able to run that in races like Magna Course where we got the, the tough chicane come back to the finish line? <clears throat> Well, Sounds they're like going to have to do a lot of work on it. Um, they want the box. They want that quick shift gearbox because uh, it's going to save them like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 seconds a lap. Well, that's a lot of time. So they want it to work. It is, it is that it's fragile. They're going to have to work. Going to have to do some more testing on it. Will they be able to use it at bumpy tracks? Well, they'll have to decide that on the Friday. They're going to be in a better position this year than previous years because the Friday practice sessions really are practice sessions. Now they can change the lumps. If one of them grenades itself, they can put another engine in without any penalty. So what Ferrari did on the Friday, they took both transmission options with them to Melbourne. They run the system on the Friday to check whether or not they were going to be in a position to be able to run it in qualifying. They did go along that line, yeah. So really, you know, as with everything else in F1's technology, when you're looking for the absolute fractions of a thousandth right. of a second, you're going to have to run it. Because if they didn't, Lewis Hamilton, the young upstart Lewis Hamilton and Alonso are right behind in the McLaren, and they've got a lot of force and a lot of pace. Yo, you could play safe and put the manual gearbox back in, or the slower yeah. shift, I should say, but you'd lose the race. Formula One cars are like supermodels. They're always trying to control weight. Keep it down. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a commercial break on that note. More phone calls, more issues to ask these guys about. When we come back uh, and wind tunnel continues, which will be uh, momentarily here, so don't go anywhere. We'll be taking a lot more calls uh, from these guys. And uh, more on the Australian happenings. Glad you guys, by the way, stuck around to help us out with this. We'll even talk about Michael Schumacher, even though he wasn't there this week. You're watching Wind Tunnel, presented by Alto Wireless. Back with Bob Varsha and Steve Matchett. We have all the F1 calls we can handle, so now is the time to uh, call if you want to talk to uh, to Tony George. He'll be here in a little while. Sam is on the line from Stanley, Virginia. Sam, go ahead. Hey, I want to thank you for hosting the best damn racing show, period, and I have a question for Bob and Steve. Go for it. Right. What about that bonehead move that uh, David Coulthard did today <laughs> that almost killed Alexander Wirtz? Were scary. there any repercussions or penalties <clears throat> levied against him? for that or did the stewards discredit it to a stupidity <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that's in the regulations but actually no there were no penalties that we're aware of and in fact coulthard and verts actually shook hands over it afterwards and issued a release they Bruce said it was all my fault. yeah exactly watch <laughs> this maybe coming from way back let's have another look at it and have a look at it in slow-mo watch verts's right hand as the car comes by he takes it off the wheel and then red bull takes wing and that they, could have um, been really nasty. He's, he's one of the most conservative guys in the mm -hmm. series. What's going on with Coulthard? With Coulthard? Yeah. Frustration, I think, really. Uh, uh, the RB3 chassis, the new Red Bull chassis, the newer design car, it's not been as fast or as reliable as he expected it to be. Um, Coulthard, in his closing years, I think, really wanted to get a, a good couple yeah. of years under his belt to finish on, and uh, frustration. Yeah, right. there's a rumor going around. His heart may not be in it anymore, but that may be. <clears throat> you know, but... Um, but his heart was pounding for <sighs> that moment well, right there. Yeah. Anyway, right, let's, let, let's leave it there and move on because I want to get as many of these calls in as we can. Dave in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dave, you're on with the boys. Yeah, I got a question for Steve and one for uh, uh, Bob Barsha. Okay. The question for Steve is, Ch Chip Canassi said once that the tires getting down to the track is what makes race cars work. Is it the same in Formula One? I'm new to Formula One, so it's new to me. And from Bob Barsha, my question is, is the... Ferrari is so good that anybody can drive it. Meaning, okay. a, a guy like Scott Speed, if he were in that car, would he be doing well? Were you able to hear that? Kind uh, of you know, up a you, bit? your call broke up a little bit, and I missed the, the, the thrust of the question. I heard it was about tires. Can you give it to me again? Dave, you still there? Repeat your tire question. Uh, for, for Steve? Yeah. Uh, with, Ch with Chip Ganaski, uh, he said something about the tires being the key to open wheel and NASCAR right. being the same. Is it the same in Formula One? Yeah, yeah. The tyres, as, as far as the engineer are concerned on the cars, yes, it's an absolutely vital component. And this year, because Bridgestone have uh, been forced into this situation of having the monopoly, I say forced because they've uh, lost uh, Michelin, uh, the FIA have been able to dictate really how hard they make their compounds. And, of course, the harder the tyre it is, the less grip you're going to have, and that's going to control speeds. Um, so it's absolutely crucial. For me, as an engineering fan of the sport, I have to say, I love the tyre war. A lot of people are against it, but I love the fact that we had this flip-flop from Michelin to Bridgestone. One race, it was one manufacturer. 
the other race, and other manufacturers in the lead. And we had those fantastic compounds that would just work for one, one particular track. I love all that. It's expensive. It's F1. I get it, you know. <laughs> Should we put any stock in the notion that it was Bernie Ecclestone outraged at the idea of putting fan-friendly compound indicators clearly visible on the tires didn't want any part of that because it came from the champ car world series <laughs> there is buying that i i buy into that i must say yeah. but the whole idea that look if we want to put something on the tire so that the, the fans at home the viewers and the and the race commentary crews can tell whether it's a hard or soft compound then put it on so we can see it i mean the yeah. thing was like <laughs> as big as a quarter That's a complete joke yeah there's something going on that we don't know the whole story about that because bridgestone wants to be talked about. The only way they're going to do that is if people can tell what... Look at those wheels, by the way. How those things have been machined down to nothing. The only way that's going to matter is if we can tell who's on what when. Could Scott Speed win in a Ferrari? That was his other question. Well, that's why we have arguments, isn't it? Um, <laughs> can anybody drive the Ferrari and win the World Championship? No. Could Scott do it? Possibly. Maybe he'll get that chance. We'll see. But, I mean, Formula One... Uh, motorsports is a team sport. Formula One is a garage sport. You know, the best car wins world championships, and that's why all the best guys will do anything to get into the best car, and right now that's the Ferrari. In less than a minute, first race of the post-Michael era, someone in our office drew the comparison to the post-Michael era in the NBA. Michael Jordan retires, interest in the NBA drops. Well, we see the same thing in Formula One. Did Michael Schumacher bring fans who will now not be as interested because he's gone? For me, no, absolutely not. If we'd had a situation where uh, Ferrari had fallen immediately off the pace, then yes, I think we would have seen that. But um, Michael Schumacher, brilliant driver, but nevertheless, Michael Schumacher signed a Ferrari contract. Ferrari didn't sign a Michael Schumacher contract. The sport goes on. We have great drivers come and go, but in the grand history of Formula One, drivers play a very transient part. I think he left you 10 seconds. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. <laughs> well, I, and hopefully Michael brought fans to the sport who will stay because of the sport, not because of Michael. You know, we may lose some of the, some of the German fans, perhaps. Um, but, no, I, th I agree with Steve on balance. I think, you know, once folks come, because of Michael or not, hopefully they'll stay. you got guys like Lewis Hamilton coming into the sport that will hopefully yeah. keep them here. Absolutely. Great job all weekend. Thanks for sticking around and finishing it with us. We appreciate it. Thank Pleasure. you. Bob Varsha and Steve Matchett will take a commercial break. Still ahead, Tony George talking Indy cars and an all-skate phone call segment. When we come back, any topic is fair game. Wind Tunnel, presented by Alltel Wireless. Boston Red Sox a week from tonight. John Henry, owner of the Boston Red Sox and now co-owner of Roush Fenway Racing, joins us to talk about why he is both of those things. Why a Major League Baseball owner bought a hunk of Jack Roush's NASCAR team. Email your questions for John now and join us for the discussion next week. at 9 o'clock Eastern time. We'll be right back here We're doing another TV show. Dwayne's on the line from Volcano, California. Welcome, Dwayne. What's up? Hey, I just wanted to talk to you, Dave, about the next show Cup messing around with Richard Childress, you think they're going to get rid of the singular? Yep. You think they're going to do it? Uh, sounds like the courts are going to decide that. Uh, AT&T has sued over the content of the contract uh, that specifies, as NASCAR sees it, that, uh, do I have this right, that singular cannot change the name of the sponsorship on the car to, uh, to AT&T. So as, as, as long as they don't write AT&T on it anywhere, they'll be all right. Say that again? As long as they don't write AT&T on it, they'll be all right? Well, I guess, but then I think now that they've changed their, or are in the process of changing the name of the phone company, that might be counterproductive in terms of the benefit of the sponsorship. And, of course, the other big story this weekend in the same vein is Robbie Gordon having to take the Motorola decals off of his car because of conflict with uh, Nextel as the series sponsor, which, I mean, people are all upset. Where, 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 where did all this come from? That's been there since 1972. When Winston signed on as the Winston Cup sponsor, they banned any other competing cigarette company from being a major sponsor on a car. And when Nextel bought the series sponsorship, they simply put in the same provision. Now, cell phone companies are a lot more complicated perhaps than cigarettes, although they had a bit of a fight, as I recall, over smokeless tobacco uh, under the, the, the Reynolds contract. So I don't think it's all that much different. They've got so many sponsors, they're bound to have sponsor conflicts. 
That's why they have contracts, and ultimately the lawyers, you know, you may have a cadre of lawyers down there every week deciding if the paint jobs are legal. I think that's kind of unfortunate, but that's what happens when you get that much money in the sport. And it does not, it is not something new, been around a very long time. Uh, how about Doug in Sebastopol, California? Doug, what's up? Hey, I just have a comment on uh, cheating in NASCAR. Okay. And uh, my idea on it is if you want to stop it, send the whole team home, driver, crew chief, car, everybody goes home for the weekend, and I think that would just put and an the, end to any cheating. And the sponsor and the points, and that yep. would stop it. Yeah, uh, everything so goes away. You don't get nothing for the weekend. Perhaps, as we noted in Daytona, they kind of liked having all those headlines during the week when there was nothing going on at the racetrack to keep interest up in the race. Maybe. This is a possibility. Uh, after the Vegas race last week, we asked a Racer Magazine question of the week. We wanted to know what other NASCAR track should be reconfigured and why, and some of your answers were pretty funny. We're going to get to that. But first, well, let's see. There is this rumor about that MotoGP might be coming to Indianapolis. And then there's the future of Formula One at Indianapolis. And then there's, there's the IndyCar season opener. And I presume we may want to talk about the split in American open wheel racing, all of the above, with Indianapolis Motor Speedway President Tony George next on Wind Tunnel, presented by Alltel Wireless. During his tenure as president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Tony George has made huge changes. His creation of the Indy Racing League in 1996 split the open wheel world. Eleven years later, it remains a hotly debated topic. He defied tradition by bringing stock cars to the Speedway. Now the Brickyard 400 is the second biggest race in NASCAR. He brought Formula One back to America. The U.S. Grand Prix remains at Indy despite the Michelin tire debacle of a couple of years ago. And now the buzz says the Speedway will host a second American round of MotoGP, the Motorcycle World Championship, perhaps as early as next year. With that, it is a pleasure to welcome Tony George back to the Wind Tunnel. Tony, thanks for giving us your time tonight. We appreciate it. You're welcome, Dave. Let's start with the latest of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway stories. Last week, we showed folks the MotoGP guys' rough drawing of how a, uh, a track would work at Indy, counterclockwise, eliminating turn one of the oval. And we also heard that if that change is made uh, with modifications to pit in and pit out, that it would become the Formula One track, one piece at a time. What needs to happen for MotoGP to come to Indy? Well, as part of the due diligence, we were talking to both uh we, meaning Joey Chitwood and Mel Harder primarily, and uh, Terry Angstadt were leading those discussions. But uh, as part of the due diligence, they were uh, speaking with World Superbike and MotoGP, and it seems to have settled out with uh, MotoGP as the best opportunity. Um, we have, you know, as part of our due diligence, also uh, uh, considered the, what the track configuration would look like, and also how that might impact the facility as a whole, but also the Formula One event. And uh, probably um, a few weeks ago, I'd say, maybe three, three weeks ago, um, both the FIA and, and FIM representatives were over uh, at the same time to go over the drawings, which they'd already seen, but uh, did a site inspection. And I think, you know, perhaps, um, you know, we'll, we'll make the the changes to the facility that will accommodate bikes and also give Formula One some options if they so choose to uh, go with a different configuration. Give me odds on the likelihood that the bike race will happen. Well, probably better than 50-50. Um, you know, we've been contemplating it as a part of our centennial celebration uh, for 2009, the opening of, of the Speedway in 2000 or in 1909. Uh, the first race that took place, motorized race that took place, was a motorcycle race. It wasn't very successful, but it took place nonetheless. And so we thought, as part of um, that celebration, that we would we would uh, uh, look at, at running a motorcycle race. We've since kind of moved that forward a year uh, ahead of our earlier expectations, but uh, we we tend to think in terms of it being a year-long celebration. So if it takes place in '08 then you know it would, it would sort of kick that off so to speak where do you stand with ecclestone as far as the future of the of the usgp i mean the speedway took a big hit in that michelin fiasco and in the wake of that i'm wondering if your business relationship with f1 is such that that race is there over the long haul 
Well, I hope it is, and um, you know, there was there's been talk about possibly a second race in the United States, trying to help build some uh, uh, very much needed energy and momentum for Formula One in the United States. Um, you know, we we never really got the the Grand Prix at, at Indianapolis on stable enough ground to uh, to consider that as an opportunity. Um, I hope it's going to be part of our schedule for a long time to come. Um, my relationship with Bernie remains the same. I mean, you know, it was unfortunate the events of 2005, but. Um, you know, we had some help uh, from Michelin in 2006 trying to make it right. The challenge is going to be can we make it a, a viable business opportunity for the future. And I've spoken to Bernie as recently as the last three or four weeks and uh, mainly just catching up. I, I hadn't wished him Happy New Year or a prosperous New Year, as he likes to put it. <laughs> but uh, Prosperous for him. Yeah. Uh, but. But I think uh, we're going to have to just take a wait and see. Um, you know, hopefully we can we can uh, come to an agreement on a on a future uh, extension of a contract that would allow both parties to get what they need out of it and keep the continuity of having it at Indianapolis. I need a break. We'll do that. We'll come back on the other side. Talk open wheel racing with Tony George, president of Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Don't go anywhere. Wind tunnel presented by Alltel Wireless continues right after this time. -out. We're back talking with Tony George. Tony, I got to tell you. Virtually every email we got about your appearance here tonight is about the split. I picked one that has no more than the average amount of name calling in it. Uh, I want you to respond to this. It says, Mr. George, 11 years ago, your insistence to create the IRL began a crippling downward spiral for open wheel racing in this country. When are you going to address the needs of the open wheel community as a whole instead of this senseless power play you launched in 96? Fix it or forget it. Fans like me are walking away from the sport, and it's signed Chief. What do you say to all those people sending me those emails? I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I guess, a burden to carry it around on your shoulders when it's put like that. Um, I heard someone on the program earlier. One of the callers said that they're 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 tuning out of NAS <coughs> excuse me tuning out of NASCAR and starting to tune into IRL and Champ Car and Formula One. I mean, everybody's got an opinion. I don't think that uh, you know the events of the last 10, 12 years have uh, um, been fairly placed squarely on my shoulders. I think you know there's there's a lot of dynamic in there I, if if i could wave a magic wand and make it all right i would but that's impossible so um, you know i don't know I, you know fans like that are obviously passionate and and um, are consumers and they're able to make a choice he seems to have hung in there this long uh, hope to keep him involved uh, a little longer and maybe it'll all work out to his satisfaction you know what i would like to hear because this it, this we always hear that some power trip, some ego trip, some this or that. I would like to hear your perception of what led you to the decision to do this, because I don't recall having heard that since way back in, in 96. <clears throat> what was the IRL intended to fix? What was wrong? Well, for one thing, we were wanting to encourage an investment in new uh, permanent oval facilities and some new markets. Uh, when we announced it in 94 and, and uh, launched our first race at Disney in 96, all the new tracks that, that we're running at and NASCAR's running at today, most of them, uh, all the new ones obviously weren't here. There's been a couple of billion dollars put into that. Arguably, uh, NASCAR has uh, driven a lot of that, but you know, those tracks need inventory and uh, profitable activities to sustain them. And we want to offer that. And I think that um, clearly CART at that time was going more and more towards street racing. And, and uh, uh, as, as, as the 90s, late 90s wore on into the early 2000, the, 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 the balance uh, or the ratio, I would say, of ovals versus road courses uh, became more uh, pronounced towards road racing. So. Um, 
You know, I mean, it's, it's filling a niche. I think we put on good, competitive, exciting racing on ovals. We're an oval track over here across the street. And, um, you know, we want to we be a part of, of the future. We want to provide some leadership. It would have been my hope that a lot of the cart teams would have, would have uh, not taken the position they did, but rather, you know, uh, found, found some... Um, opportunity to have dialogue and and there has been dialogue over the course of the last 10 years we've just not been able to resolve anything and i think it really comes from looking at things from two different perspectives the most recent dialogue with kevin kalkoven when you and he were reportedly talking merger he kind of admonished the press to butt out we've done that on wind tunnel we haven't reported on that since uh, since he said that um and now that seems to have stopped it seems fair to revisit the issue have you and kevin stop talking about a possible merger um we stay in touch in fact i owe him a call he called me a few weeks ago while i was in st louis at my daughter's horse show and posed a, a, a thought or a question that i haven't really gotten back to him on but uh you know i, I think last fall we we agreed that we, you know unification wasn't eminent it wasn't likely in the next couple of years and we needed to keep the uh, lines of communication open and uh, I enjoy his company socially I believe he does mine uh, when the opportunity presents itself we, we we interact but we have to deal with each other on a professional level as well and you know we kind of agreed that we weren't going to be you know sticking daggers in one another's back and but admit that that it wasn't likely now something could change I don't foresee it but um, they, they've sort of got their vision and, and the, uh, the plan they're pursuing. They've got a new car, which won't really work for what we do. Um, perhaps so in a few years, things run their course. We could um, you know, make some progress towards uh, getting it back uh, into one single series. But um, who knows? By then, they may achieve or realize some success, as, as will we. And um, perhaps it'll just mean more, more and better racing all the way around. That's where we'll leave it with a plug for next week's season opener. Uh, night race, Homestead Miami Speedway, Saturday night. Do I have the facts right? That is. First time we open on a, on a Saturday night. Do I, how many seconds do you have left, Dave? Take it. Whatever. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say I don't watch your show religiously, but I was tuned in a couple of weeks ago when um, Ed and Robin were on, and Robin made a comment that he thinks it's uh, uh, widely known that, that he hates me and I hate him. I, just for the record, I would like to say I don't necessarily like Robin or, or the, the, the approach he takes to journalism. Um, I do appreciate, though, that he does speak with a lot of passion um, and insight, but uh, under no circumstances should people believe that I hate Robin Miller. Fair enough. Well said. We appreciate you taking time to be with us tonight. Hope you have a successful season opener next Saturday night. Thank you. That's Tony George. We'll take a break. We'll come back with some fun track re re uh, reconfiguration, is what I'm trying to say. Emails. Wind Tunnel presented by Alltel Wireless. Stick around. Rehearsing during the commercial break. Watch this. We're going to talk about track reconfiguration. Uh, last week, big fuss over all the changes Las Vegas uh, Motor Speedway. Our Racer Magazine question of the week asked, what other NASCAR Speedway should be reconfigured? And your answers were kind of fun. Check out some of these emails. The only tracks NASCAR should change are all the tracks that are not Bristol. <laughs> Uncle Kevin up in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Uh, Dave, they need to reconfigure most of the NASCAR tracks because all they do is go around in a circle, tear out the ovals, and make them all road courses. Jack DM. Dave Talladega. Bulldoze the turns, reduce the banking, make it so they have to back off and dispose of the restrictor plates. Coincidentally, John in Fishers, Indiana, agrees with Dale Earnhardt Sr. Finally, I would reconfigure the backstretch at Daytona, extending it to the ocean and off a pier into the Atlantic. Then the rest of the season wouldn't be glutted with coverage of this overhyped monster called NASCAR from GK in San Mateo, California. Let's go to Allen in Chino Hills, California. Allen, what's up? Yeah, um, this is a two-part question. Mark huh? Martin not racing next week. What do you think about it? And do you think he's just going to race, you know, um, or miss the next two races and come back and run the full season? No, I think he's going to run the schedule that he said he was going to run, which includes not 
racing at Bristol. I don't remember when he comes back, but, you know, through all of this, what's Mark going to do? What's Mark going to do? Mark has said the same thing. I'm not going to run Bristol. And so, end of story. Um, what's the second part of the question? What do you think? Uh, you think he's going to come back after, you know, Texas because he's coming back. Texas is his next race. Texas is his next race. race. Run yeah, the rest of the why, why would he do that? I mean, what, what, what would be the I, I logic? I personally think that? he's going to be sitting because he has a, a thing down at his uh, dealership in Arkansas with the fans down there. I think he's going to get flack from the fans. Why aren't you at the racetrack right now? And I think he's going to kind of, you know, look at it and go, why aren't I at the racetrack right now? If what that, do you think? If that happens, if he feels like he needs to run the races, what he says is the team will give him that opportunity. I don't see that happening. I mean, I think he's got this thing laid out the way he wants it. I think he's got the sweetest deal anybody could have cut, uh, even though he says he took a pay cut to make it happen. I mean, he's got the schedule he wants, and I think he's going to run it, and I think the rest of us probably need to get over it. Just my yeah. opinion. We need to uh, take a commercial break at that point. We will do that. We'll come back uh, on the other side and see how much time is left in the television show, which is called Wind Tunnel and is presented by Alltel Wireless. That's important information in case there's a future sponsor conflict. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by Alltel Wireless. Get my circle exclusively from Alltel. In the top fuel car there, uh, Sarge won, Caps won, Anderson won, and Stouffer won in NHRA action at the, the Gator Nationals today. Jim's on the line from Truckee, California. Jim, what's up? Hi, Dave. Love your show. Thank you. I was wondering to know who or what team is going to offer Michael Schumacher a ton of money to race in the Indy 500, a title his illustrious career is lacking. Uh, it, I don't know the answer to that. It doesn't matter how much money they offer him. I don't think he's going to do that. Could, do you see that happening? Do you think Michael Schumacher would really run the Indy 500? No, I mean, you know, uh, it is a title I think most driver would love to have, you know, in Man. his resume, you know, and drivers are definitely ego-driven. Now, I don't disagree with that, but i got to think after you've survived that the career that Schumacher has survived and you've got, you know, $800 million in the bank or whatever, you just say, you know what, I don't think I need to go run Indy. But then that's just my opinion. I'd love to see it happen. I don't know which team could possibly afford him. Last call goes to Ron in Monroe, Virginia. Ron, yeah. what's on your mind? Quick, yeah. Ron, we're about out of time. Okay, buddy. I just want to know about Michael.